Hi, everyone. Uh, so here we are for our second segment of day one. And in this segment, I'm going to briefly introduce the characters and the themes of Angels in America part one. So I will screen share here for the PowerPoint. Okay, so um, our characters, we have Prior Walter, the 34th, but, or the 32nd, if you don't count the bastards. He is young, 31 years old, gay, uh, from a very old English family. We're told that he had ancestors who came to America on the Mayflower in the early 1600s. So that would make his ancestors among the first European settlers in North America. And he has AIDS. Louis Ironson is Pryor's lover. He is intense, funny, selfish, and self-absorbed, and also terribly guilt-ridden about his own selfishness. And one thing we learn pretty quickly about Lewis is that he cannot deal with illness and he cannot deal with old age. Basically, he can't handle bodies uh, and their less pleasant functions and dysfunctions. He is a Jewish, third generation American, and the play starts with the funeral of his immigrant grandmother. Then we have Belize, who is an African American gay nurse, and he is Prior Walter's friend. He also works at the hospital where uh, Roy Cohen ends up dying. Joe Pitt is a right-wing Mormon lawyer from Utah. He is a closeted homosexual, and he, he's a low-level clerk in the U.S. Court of Appeals. He's a friend of Roy Cohen's who acts as a kind of mentor to him. And Harper Pitt is Joe's emotionally fragile, sexually frustrated, anxiety-ridden wife. And she takes Valium in wee fistfuls. And then there's Roy Cohen. Roy Cohen is a historical figure. He's based on a real figure who was a lawyer who became famous during the McCarthy era of the 1950s. During, this is during the so-called Red Scare of the Cold War. He worked with Joseph McCarthy, who was a rabidly anti-communist senator who was responsible for a lot of the hysterical Cold War fear of communists. And the idea that there were communist spies all throughout the US that needed to be rooted out. Uh, McCarthy led a political witch hunt against alleged communists, and he destroyed the lives and reputations of many, many people, uh, people who had done little more than perhaps attend uh, meetings of the communist political party. And there is a photo of Roy Cohen, which Donald Trump in 1984, Cohen was uh, a mentor to Trump. So um, 30 years before this play is set, uh, Roy Cohen was a member of the U.S. Department of Justice's prosecution team against Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, who were found guilty in 1951 for spying uh, on the so uh, for the Soviets, rather. And uh, Roy Cohen took credit for convincing the judge to give the Rosenbergs a death penalty. They were electrocuted. And we see him telling Joe Pitt in this play, much to Joe's horror, that uh, he did this, that he helped to convince the judge to give him the death penalty. Um, now, this was an entirely illegal thing to do because lawyers are not supposed to have any contact at all with the judge in a case um, outside of the court proceedings themselves. And Cohen in the play, he admits that he did that. Uh, no one else in this entire affair was executed and the most damning evidence against Ethel Rosenberg was fabricated. Uh, her brother admitted to fabricating it years later. 
And Ethel Rosenberg's involvement in espionage is considered by historians to have been dubious, although her husband Julius did have some involvement. The importance of his involvement is debatable. It's, it's debated by historians. At any rate, Roy Cohen was extremely proud of his role in their prosecution and their subsequent uh, execution. Roy Cohen was a closeted homosexual, as Kushner depicts. And like uh, many other closeted right-wing homosexual politicians, um, he wasn't a politician, but he's a public figure, he was publicly scornful of homosexuals and he lobbied against legislation for homosexual rights. He worked for the family values agenda, which emerged in 1980s uh, in Reg the Reagan era United States. In 1984, he was diagnosed with AIDS and he died in 1986. He was disbarred as a lawyer just before he died. And we see this in part two of the play. He was disbarred for borrowing, quote unquote, $100,000 from a client. And as I said, this is in part two of the play. And the ghost of, Rose, of Ethel Rosenberg uh, gleefully tells him that he's no longer a lawyer. Um, we'll spend more time on Roy Cohen next day. Um, to some degree, this is a character-driven play with fairly well-developed um, psychologies and not just sketches. Okay, so the opening scene of the play, 1-1, one, one, um, I tend to think of this as a, a kind of... Um, prologue. The opening scene is, is uh, the funeral with the rabbi. Um, and I think of it as a kind of prologue because it brings up and sets up topics and themes and images, etc., that will reemerge later. Uh, so these are some of the themes that are introduced um, in, in that first scene. Uh, death, history, religion and spirituality, identity, American identity, family, migration, immigration. The theme of death is introduced, of course, because it's a funeral. It's a, it's a funeral of Lewis's grandmother. And shortly after this scene, Lou, Lewis confesses that he abandoned his grandmother when she was in the old age home uh, and that he hasn't, hadn't actually seen her in five years. So he couldn't handle old age and disease and death. And as he says, I pretended for years that she was already dead. When they called to say she had died, it was a surprise. I abandoned her. And this, of course, foreshadows uh, his abandonment of Pryor when Pryor gets sick. Religion is introduced in, um, by the fact that we have a rabbi speaking at a Jewish funeral. And, and this is our first introduction as well to the Jewish characters as an identity group that will appear in the play. So besides Lewis, the Jewish characters that appear are in, uh, Roy Cohen and the Rosenbergs, and of course the rabbi. So we have several characters in this play who are grappling with their religious legacies. Lewis doesn't believe that America has a spiritual past. He believes Americans are cut off from the rootedness of a long historical tradition of spirituality. He says, there are no angels in America, no spiritual past no racial past, there's only the political. So it's as though he believes that in America, uh, because America understands itself as a new country of immigrants, except of course, First Nations, it's, it's as though he believes that Americans are cut off from history.
Now, religion is also figured prominently through the Mormon characters in the play. And there are three Mormon characters dealing with their identity as Mormons after leaving the homogeneous Mormon world of Salt Lake City. So this is another ridge of religion like Judaism that claims its members as the chosen ones. Although unlike the ancient religion of Judaism, Mormonism is a young religion with, with a much shorter history. Other than indigenous First Nation spiritual traditions, this is the only American born religion. And it was founded in the 1830s or 1840s by Joseph Smith, an American. So religion intersects with themes of migration and immigration in the play. Mormon history is one of constant movement. The religious community began in New York State and then migrated west to avoid persecution. Of course, this experience mirrors uh, that of American Jews who immigrated from Europe also to avoid persecution. The three Mormon characters in the play can also be seen themselves as migrants um, in that they've all moved from their so the isolated homogeneous religious community that they come from in Salt Lake City to a, to a more secular part of the United States, to the extremely diverse city of New York. And they're learning how to live in this different world. So religion um, is significant later also in connection to uh, prior Walter, in that he hears the voice of an angel and he's visited by an angel at the very end of part one. And that angel will declare him a prophet. And we'll see in part two though, well, you'll see if we read it, um, that he's gonna reject that calling as a prophet. Okay. So history is also evoked in that first opening scene. The rabbi evokes the long history of the ancient religion and culture of Judaism. And specifically, he discusses the Jews from Russia and Lithuania who, who came in mass numbers to the U.S. in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to escape persecution in Eastern Europe where they were, they were subjected to, to violence and to anti-Semitic laws. And the rabbi evokes that particular experience and the experience um, of immigrant women like Lewis's grandmother, who brought Eastern European Jewish culture uh, with them to the United States. And he talks about how that culture endures in the bones of her descendants. And, and this is what he says. He says, you do not live in America. No such place exists. Your clay is the clay of some Litvak shuttle, your air, the air of the steppes, because she carried the old world on her back across the ocean in a boat, and she put it down on Grand Court, Concourse Avenue or in Flatbush. And she worked that earth into your bones and you pass it to your children, this ancient, ancient culture and home. So it's a really curious thing to say, you do not live in America, no such place exists. And I think what he means by that is, uh, that he sees the descendants of these Jewish immigrants as carrying on the culture of the old world. Their race, and I use that word in the sense of who they are as a people, um, and their religion is that of the old Jewish uh, European world they've come from. He seems to suggest that the Jewish people, even those born in the US who, who haven't actually immigrated there, will always retain in their bones the marks of that experience. It's, it's a kind of inheritance, um, that, that experience of their old homes in Eastern Europe, 
the experience of being persecuted and forced to leave their homes and the hard journeys they made after they left their homes uh, to the new world, to a new world and a new world for them. So he might be seen, in fact, as um, confirming um, what Lewis says about there being no race or spiritual past in America. Neither of them uh, sees America itself as a place with its own spiritual or racial history. However, the rabbi suggests that American Jews have what is passed on to them from their Jewish European ancestors, which um, is not like what Lewis says, because Lewis suggests that the inhabitants of the U.S. are cut off from the ancient past and, you know, from that shared ancient racial or spiritual history. Now, both the rabbi and Lewis seem to very problematically elide or erase the history of indigenous First Nations in America. They talk of America solely as a place people immigrate to and ignore the fact that it is a place where people already lived uh, with full, complex, and varied cultures before European and Asian uh, settlement. Now, um, the rabbi and Lewis ignore the history of indigenous First Nations, but Kushner is aware of it. And uh, he gives the rabbi a significant line. The rabbi says, she was the last of the Mohicans, this one was, uh, referring to Lewis's grandmother, of course. And what he means is that she was the last survival, survivor of a noble race or tribe. And, and this is a line from James Fenimore Cooper's 19th century histor historical novel about the American frontier, The Last of the Mohicans. And what Kushner does by giving the rabbi this line, the, the, these words, is he creates analogies and associations that are significant uh, for the play. And it's not the character of the rabbi who's doing that, who's making those associations. Kushner is. He's, he's, having, he's, he's making it by having the rabbi use this expression, use these words. So when the rabbi says she was the last of Mo the Mohicans, this one was, uh, Kushner weaves the Jewish immigrant experience into the indigenous American experience for us. Um, the audience to connect, to make a connection. And that connection is about land. Um, the rabbi evokes the land, the clay of the Litvak shuttle um, that immigrants like Sarah Ironson were tied to and which they were pushed off of, um, you know, when they were forced to immigrate to the United States. And that reminds us um, of the ties of the land of North America by indigenous peoples here who were also pushed off their land. The Jews fled Europe to escape genocide, to avoid extinction. And here in North America, Aboriginal people, of course, faced extin extinction and genocide as well on their own lands. And these evocations of genocide and persecution connect with the main aspects of the play in that in the 1980s, uh, gay men in North America faced with AIDS and an indifferent government uh, that would not step in and adequately fund research into AIDS. Uh, these men feared that they were also facing um, a genocide. They were facing a plague that would decimate them as a community, as a people, uh, you know, through the inaction of government. So they feared that they, they, they feared extinction or genocide by inaction. Okay, so the theme of history and the historical baggage or legacies that people carry is first evoked in the opening scene. Um, 
And then it's picked up by the character of Prior Walter as well. And we learn that uh, he has a very long, long history. He's the 32nd Prior Walter or the 34th in his ancient family. And he has an ancestor depicted on the Bayou Tapestry, uh, which was made in the 15th century. The Bayou Tapestry is a famous tapestry that depicts events leading up to the Norman conquest of England in 1066, as well as the conquest itself. So um, with the death of Prior Walter, who has AIDS in 1986, will that long line of history end? Is this another extinction? Another theme introduced uh, by the rabbi's speech is American identity. And when he talks about immigrants coming to the United States, he talks about their children growing up in this strange place, in the melting pot where nothing melted. And he is, of course, evoking a dominant metaphor to describe the United States, the melting pot uh, where immigrants come and where different cultural, religious, ethnic, and racial identities are understood to blend together to create a single American identity. And it's a lofty ideal of oneness and equality uh, within which no one is marked by difference. Nobody is marked as different, as standing out. And this vision, this idea of the melting pot is a vision that offers uh, likeness as equality. All will be equal because all will share the sameness, this Americanness. No one will be marked as different as other. It's interesting. It's a different metaphor than the Canadian metaphor of identity, which is the mosaic, the idea of the quilt of difference um, that all together makes a colorful whole. So it's a slightly different vision. At any rate, it's, it's significant that the rabbi talks about the melting pot where nothing melts because the people in this play, this play is peopled by marked humans, by by people who carry some kind of stigma on their body or in their person because of who they are, because of who their ancestors are and where they've come from. It's full of Americans who stand out in some way and who don't melt easily into that homo homogeneous Americanness. So we get Lewis, who is marked by his Jewishness and his homosexuality. We get Belize, who is marked by his African-American race and his, also his homosexuality. Uh, we learn that Harper Pitt never quite fit in in Salt Lake City. In, in Joe's words, she was always wrong, always doing something wrong, like one step out of step. In Salt Lake City, that stands out. And we get Joseph Pitt, who appeared to fit in perfectly, a white male Christian, but always felt marked off as different, always felt different inside. He never felt that he fit in. Um, and, you know, he says, he says that it was hard for him um, to pass. And of course, he felt different because he was sexually attracted to men. Um, and his Christian Mormon world it told him that that was not okay. And he struggled to suppress that those feelings that he had. And then later we see when he's with Lou, he's marked off by his temple garment, uh, which is um, it's a form of underwear that is worn by Mormons, which Lou comments on. Um, so his Mormonism also marks him off as different among New York uh, gay men. And then even prior Walter, you know, who comes from this you know, ridiculously long line of Anglo-Saxon whiteness is marked. Now, of course, in North American society, 
that Anglo-Saxon whiteness is considered unmarked. It's, it's the default position. Um, you know, the American without the prefix, the, the, the white American, the white European um, descended American is not African American. He's not Jewish American. He's not Asian American. He's not from a religious group that stands out to some extent like the Mormons. But Prior Walter is marked. He's marked by his sexual orientation. And he is literally marked by his disease. And he shows those lesions, those KS lesions, very near the first scene, and, uh, which he calls the wine-dark kiss of the angel of death. So Angels in America is about being marked by one's identity. How in America, and I would include Canada in that, there is this ideal of everyone being equally American, equally Canadian, and having the same claim or right to that identity in one big melting pot of Americanness. But Angels suggests that many, many Americans are marked off as different and don't melt into a pot of equal access to American identity. Its main exploration is about the mark of disease, but the exploration of American identity is, is part of its story about gay men and AIDS. It seems that what the place suggests as a quintessential part of American identity is not escaping persecution and coming to the US to experience equality and freedom. It is rather the experience of oppression, persecution and being marked as different within one's own space, within one's own world on one's own land. Just as the true Americans, uh, the people of the indigenous first nations were persecuted on their own land. So too are many other Americans, the object of prejudice and discrimination and oppression in America, despite what should be by the ideals and myths of American identity, their birthright of freedom and equality. Okay, finally, the first prologue-like scene also introduces the theme of family and the, the play explores the significance of family. Uh, and in that opening scene, of course, we get Lewis at the funeral of his paternal grandmother with a large extended loving family um, bound by their history and shared culture and reflected in their Jewish names. And later we hear about the families of other characters. Uh, Joe, we learn, was unloved by his father and we see him pushed away by his mother in his moment of need. And we see him sort of adopted and mentored by Roy Cohen. Harper, we learn, had a troubled, possibly traumatic uh, home life. Um, Joe describes it as a lot of drinking and physical stuff taking place there. And then Pryor, of course, comes from an old family with a long line of ancestors. And yet, through the course of the two parts of the play, we see that his family is not his blood relations, um, who we never see except for the ghosts. It's Belize and Lewis and even the night nurse and eventually in part two, Hannah Pitt. And we see Pryor redefining family and creating his own family. His hybrid family is a rejection of the narrative that we, you know, that who we are is determined by race, religion and lineage. His hybrid family is linked um, they're linked together by values, politics, and simple historical contingency. And of course, all these themes, um, they, they, these themes and motifs intersect with each other. Um, 
for instance, you know, history is, is tied to identity. Um, and, you know, the rabbi evokes this, this history of Jewish persecution and immigration to talk about Jewish identity. Uh, you know, but as he does that, he suggests a single Jewish history and identity, which is false. And we get several different Jewish characters. We get Sarah Ironson, Louis Ironson, Roy Cohen, Ethel Rosenberg, and the rabbi. And it's very clear that they um, that they are very different, and that their histories of in America is not one single indivisible history. Uh, when we when we look at Roy Cohen and Ethel Rosenberg, it's clear that their cultural and religious heritage cannot erase differences um, in their values and interests, uh, which are vastly divided. And, and they have very different versions of Jewish identity. Uh, Roy Cohen and Ethel Rosenberg may or may not both trace their ancestors back to grandparents uh, fleeing persecution in Eastern Europe, um, but their histories don't erase, uh, don't end there. And in fact, they don't even begin there. Um, they've, they've They've created and become part of very different American histories of Jewish people and, and thus create, have created a diversity of Jewish identities. History and identity uh, intersect in the story of the Mormons um, that we get in Angels as well. Harper, Joe, and Hannah Pitt are all faced with the prospect of moving their personal identities away from a predetermined idea of what it means to be Mormon. And they are each faced um, with the choice of accepting the identity that is offered to them by their religion and that, and, and that religion's history, or changing what it means to them to be Mormon and creating a new Mormon identity for themselves. And two of them accept this challenge, Harper and Hannah, while well, Joe makes steps toward that change. Uh, and he makes steps towards accepting his homosexuality, but it's not clear that he is able to change fully, ultimately. Now, one thing uh, Jewish, Mormon, and American identity have in common is the idea of chosenness or election. American exceptionalism is part of the American mythology of identity. It's part of its history as a new nation after the American Revolution. The myth of American exceptionalism uh, based on its ideology of liberty, egalitarianism, individualism, democracy, and free markets um, includes the idea that it has a unique mission to change the world for the better. And thus it sees itself as superior to all other nations in the world. Um, it sees itself as elect, as having a national exceptionalism. That is, this is part of a certain myth of America. I'm not saying that all individual Americans accept this idea. And that idea or myth of American exceptionalism was emphasized anew by Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. And uh, Joe Pitt talks about this to Harper when he's trying to convince her to move to Washington, DC. And Joe says, America has rediscovered itself, its sacred position among nations. And people aren't ashamed of that like they used to be. This is a great thing. The truth restored, law restored. That's what President Reagan's done, Harper. He says truth exists and can be spoken proudly. And the country responds to him. We become better, more good. I need to be part of that. Now, like I said, this idea of American exceptionalism connects with ideas uh, um, that Judaism and Mormonism posit about their religions. 
um, the idea of the Jews as the chosen people of God is based on their descent from the ancient Israel, uh, Israelites and the idea that they had a special coven, covenant with God to fulfill a special purpose, a specific purpose. And that's referred to in the book of Deuteronomy and in other places in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, Mormons, the Latter-day Saints, see their descent as from two tribes of Israel, uh, the, the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Manasseh, the house of Joseph. And I may be pronouncing those wrong. Like Judaism, Mormonism asserts that they have a special covenant with God. Now, they don't dispute um, Jewish chosenness, but they believe that Jews will accept Mormonism at the end of times. And they believe that all people will have the opportunity to enter into this covenant during the millennium. That is the period of a thousand years of peace after the second coming of Christ. Now, ultimately, Kushner is critiquing these ideas about exceptionalism. He sees the histories of election, of chosenness, um, you know, the, these ideas that nations and religions write for themselves as histories of exclusion. If someone or some group is chosen, it necessarily means that others are left out. And this is uh, relevant and significant for a play about contagion, and particularly a play about AIDS written in the context of homophobic responses to the disease. Homophobic responses that sought to posit the gay community as being outside the moral norm of American society, as being punished for deviance by the disease. Okay, that ends this section. And um, for day two's lecture, we'll move on to discuss the intersection of gay identity, the body, and AIDS.